Hey everyone, the greatest goblin that ever lived is here for a comic book review for this particular week of September 2015. And yeah, it may be a little bit late, but like I said, gotta find the time to do this. For this particular week's review, got a big stack here. Got some DC, got some Marvel, and I got some dynamite. We're going to run through DC, run through Dynamite, and end with Marvel. Alright, we're going to start DC off with Batman number 44. Uh, awesome Green Lantern cover here from Tony Daniel. Really good. Honestly, though, I feel like that's the best part of this issue, is this variant cover. You know, it's like, with all due respect to Scott Snyder, I mean, Scott Snyder has been killing it on Batman. And this is no exception. But man, this this really came off feeling like like filler, like so. Mister Bloom was out doing his thing back when Bruce was wearing the cow. Okay, good to know that. Now what? It's like, and we don't really actually see too much of Mister Bloom in here. Um. It basically follows Batman around, who's, you know, following these troubled people around and everything. And that's pretty much it. I mean, um, don't get me wrong, it's not a horrible book. It's just, I just felt like it was just there. I mean, I really wasn't, I really wasn't fully captivated by this issue. And that's a shame, because I kind of feel like I should have been. I don't know what it is. It, this it's just there and it's above average it's an above average read don't get me wrong but you know I'm you know I'm I'm gonna give it a three you know there was effort there but like I said it's just just didn't hit me all right see that <sighs> yeah you're up, bud. It appears my presence may have been missed, but I am here. I assure you, I am here to discuss my thoughts on a book of my world. Earth 2, Society, number 4, Superman City of Tomorrow. What can I say about this? We have, we have a backstory explaining why Power Girl cannot stand this new Superman hardly at all anymore. The story was going well, telling story about how close they were getting. Hell, it even seemed like they were forming some sort of romantic bond with each other. And then the big bombshell is dropped concerning this Superman, and it drove Kara to a whole nother level of angry. We also learned something else about the Kryptonians in this issue that may come to my advantage. <clears throat> Excuse me, I mean that may add more impact and drama to the storytelling later on down the line in the series. Nearly got a little ahead of myself there. <laughs> but all in all, a really decent addition to the Earth 2 saga, if you will. The writing is good. The artwork is good. Pacing is decent. Still not the best stuff told about my planet. In my opinion, the man who called himself Tom Taylor did a fantastic job writing about my world. And I miss him on there. His stories about my world were really captivating, were really intriguing, and kept our attention. This team, not so much, but they're trying, and I give them credit for that, as only I should. Who better to give an honest critique about an Earth 2 book than a man from Earth 2? But so far about Superman's City of Tomorrow has, has more to be desired. I don't quite buy that he's able to build this entire city all by himself when he doesn't have nearly as much knowledge about 
the earth as other people have. But then again, that's just me. And it's that old comic book logic coming into play. So, for this, I give it a 3.5. What do you think about this? Let me know. Please, let me know. I like hearing your feedback. It makes me feel good. <laughs> My apologies. You'll learn more about me in due time. True, I am not the original. Well, then again, things have changed since the convergence. I may not act like the original Earth 2 Blue Goblin, but I can, sure, I can assure you, I am him. Thanks for watching. Back to my Earth Prime counterpart, as I like to call him. Farewell, my friends. <laughs> The dude is getting weirder every time he comes by. I don't know what his deal is. I don't know what happened to him after the convergence went through. I really don't. It's like he became a different person. Some of the shit he's been saying here has been sounding kind of cryptic, but as far as his review of this book, I agree. Uh, you know... You know, Wilson, Jimenez, and Sanchez, they got a lot, they have big shoes to fill coming off of Tom Taylor's run on the book. You know, but, you know, just like he said, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> uh, the Harley Quinn Road Trip Special. It's a $6 one-shot. Uh, to me... Was this worth six dollars? A little bit. Now, if this were a four ninety nine book, then I would say, yeah, definitely. They added an extra dollar. You know, okay. Good things. There's good things and there's bad things, but there's far more good than bad. First great thing is the Gotham City Sirens have reunited. That's always a plus. Fucking awesome. Love that. Always love seeing the sirens together. Another good thing there is they amped up the innuendos. I mean, they amped them up. The innuendos, they went nuts with them. And you know what? It, that works. It's good for a cheap laugh. It, I like that. Uh... And I've, I've talked to people, I've talked to dear friends of mine on Tumblr and everything. I, I don't know what it is. But I really still, I believe now more than ever that Connor or Palmiani, one of them, has to have a foot fetish. I mean, Jesus Christ. <sighs> That's enough about that. Um, but Harley, we've, we learned that Harley has an, had an uncle, had an uncle, that she was very close with. We get to learn more about her, her past. And it's done in a nice way. It's done in a very touching way. It's, you know, and we get to see a side of Harley. We don't really get to see that often. And I like that. She's still a nutso bitch. But when we get to see the size that we see of her in here, it really adds to the storytelling. It really does. But, you know, and also in here, it's always good to see the Cyrus together. But the scene, most of the scenes with Harley and Ivy together, you almost see, you really, you almost see the closeness that these two really have. You know, you know, DC has, you know, in the past, here recently, has revealed that, you know, they are now a canonized couple, which, duh, that's fine. You can go ahead and claim that. We've known that for years. But you get to see a more passionate bond between the two of them in here. It's not plastered everywhere, but what we do get in here, it's really touching, really nicely done. 
of course the comedy is there and it just it's just hit for hit for hit for hit for hit I loved it I thought it was great I thought this was a fun read Thought it was a great issue nicely done not perfect but really touching really gripping good stuff I loved it I give it a four All right, we're ending DC with Starfire number four, The Creature from Below. I still stand by what I've been saying about this and to Connor and Palmiotti. Because you can write it like Harley doesn't mean you should. I've said that time after time. However, we're finally getting somewhere with this series. Especially with the introduction of Atlee, you know, uh, the second Terra, if you will. We're finally getting somewhere with this, and I'm glad they brought her in, because she really adds to it. Now Starfire has another superpower that she can bond with. She has another super being that she can bond with, excuse me. And, uh, just all around really good stuff. They find this creature that has been having this rivalry with Atlee and the way they defeat him is actually really impressive. I'm not going to ruin it though. This is one of those times where I don't want to go into too much detail about a Starfire comic because they really stepped their game up with this one. They really did and that's awesome. I'm glad they're putting forth more of an effort you know to try to differentiate this from the Harley Quinn series. It's not completely finished. There is still similarities between this and the, to this tying to Harley Quinn's uh, shtick, if you will. But but the less said about Harley's shtick, the better. <laughs> but this was this was good. They really did try to make this book shine. I really did. I really do feel that way. I give this a 3.5. A good job. A nice step up. Going on to Dynamite. Start Dynamite and oh, it's a Dynamite Dark Horse book. Red Sonja Conan, number two. Victor Gishler and, and uh, Castro. Gotta love this Ed Bennis cover. But Gishler's writing. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is good. This is really good. And Castro's artwork really works in here. I mean, wow. You know, when the time comes for Gail Simone's Red Sonja run to come to, to finish, which it's not that far away, I think this I think this particular team should do an uh do a Red Sonja series or a Red Sonja Mini or whatever, you know, after this is done because they're really doing a good job here. Especially with the, the artwork, the action, the drama, and the attention to detail on Sonya and Conan's relationship. There is a bond there. But it's not a force-fed romantic relationship. You know, it's kind of more like a friends with benefits kind of thing that they got going on here. And that even that aspect is not force-fed upon us. And I really dig that. I thought that was a, thought that was a nice touch. Um, but wow, a lot of crazy shit happens in this book. Really, a real big whole bunch of crazy shit happens. And of course, Sonya and Conan are going to win it out in the end, especially in this issue. But they're really putting a heavy focus on uh, the main antagonist in here and just how paranoid and how crazy this guy is getting. I mean, it's it's almost like he's going into madness. It, it is really gripping and it makes me want to read the next issue that much more. Pardon the train in the background, blowing the whistle off like that. Uh, but overall, a really, really nice issue. Really, really good. Uh, good job, Victor Gishler, and good job, uh, Castro. Really good. Not perfect, but damn it, I like it. I give it a four. All right, moving on to Swords of Sorrow number five. Gail Simone and uh, Sergio Davila. I uh, hope I pronounced that second name right. But 
Yeah, it's time for Old Blue's uh, mandatory butt kissing of Gail Simone, if you will. Um, look, I've made it no secret that Swords of Sorrow has been kind of eh here lately. I mean, the first four issues felt all felt like just you know, it's like the first the first couple of issues were like introducing us to the characters, and then issues three and four was like the characters introducing themselves to each other. It's like, okay, enough introductions. Let's just get to it. Let's get to the main focus. What are we doing? And issue five is here. And we're finally getting to the point. We're finally getting to our purpose. What the hell are we doing? And Gail has a way of writing this. And damn it, it works. We finally get to see these hero, these heroines come up with a plan come up with a strategy for what they have to do. They find out who the three specific ones are that are meant to deal with the main antagonist of the storyline. And then, all in all, you got good interactions between the characters, and then the issue ends with the, oh, fuck, kind of moment. You know, it's one of those things. Nice. Nicely done. This was a huge step up from the past four issues. Finally, we're getting to our purposing. We're getting to what what this story is about. Bringing these characters together, giving them a common enemy to fight against, and boom! Now we're getting somewhere with this, and I really like it. Really good job. Thank you, Gail. And keep up the good work. This is... I'm expecting... If you're watching this, I'm expecting something huge for the conclusion. Don't let me down. But then again, you rarely ever do. Great issue. Good read. I dug it. But that cliffhanger. Fuck. This gets a four. Great job. Moving to Marvel. A-Force, number four. Marjorie Bennett and everybody else. This is, this is, getting, this is getting better and better the more I read it. However, I wouldn't be me if I didn't nitpick or if I didn't point something out that really does affect the story, that really affects the narrative overall, is that finding out who the traitor was. I mean, the cover spoils it alone, but at the same time, I kind of saw it coming. I really did. You gave us a red herring with Medusa earlier. But then you revealed who the true traitor was in this issue, and I was like, I'm going to be honest, I was not really surprised. I was like, eh, true to fashion. You know, it's, spoiler alert, the traitor is the female Loki. I know, it's shocking, right? Uh, a, go a god of trickery commits trickery and betrayal oh god next thing you'll tell me Bruce Wayne's fucking Batman uh, uh, but yeah really really good uh, even with the predictable reveal of the traitor the story is still really well told and you get to see that the Thors that the, well, at least the ones that are sent in to apprehend the A-Force, they're not so easily brainwashed into just, oh, it's Doom's Law, we must do this. It is Doom's Law, we must do that. You know, it's like when they see something is not just, they act upon it. They're not completely, you know, just, I, I, how do I put this? They didn't come off like, simpleton lackeys for doom they you know they they showed rational thought they they sh once they were presented with what's going on they were like oh we made a mistake they actually point out they made a mistake in here and i was like wow okay but then the ending of the issue the cliffhanger oh boy uh <laughs> um yeah uh Let's go there. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to ruin it, though. I, I, I'm sorry I spoiled the, the Loki thing, even though I'm pretty sure everybody already knows by now. 
But that cliffhanger... <clears throat> hmm. Interesting. This was a good read. It was a good issue. Uh, the problems that, you know, it, it did affect the book for me, but it was still a solid read, and I still enjoyed it for what it was. I give it a 3.5. Amazing Spider-Man Renew Your Vows, number 5. Uh, or as I like to call it, the last remaining bits of the Spider-Man family. I, I hope y'all... I hope y'all picked up this storyline, and I hope y'all treasure it because this is probably this is probably the last time we're gonna see a Parker family for quite a long time until Marvel feels they need to put out another miniseries in which we see what could have been. Yeah. Look, Marvel. No, I'm not, and I'm not talking just to Dan Slott. I'm not talking just to Joe Quesada. I'm talking to everyone at Marvel in general. If most of you, I'm, I'm pretty sure not all of you had a problem with it, but for the ones that did have a problem with Peter Parker being married, then why the fuck do you keep going back and giving us stories in which we see a married Peter Parker, and lo and behold, the storytelling is actually good? If you didn't appreciate him being married, then why do you keep going back to it? If your belief is to keep Peter Parker single to where he can't be in a committed relationship, at least stick to your shit. It's like sometimes it's like you're kind of trolling us in a sense, in a respective sense. It's like you just can't help but keep poking us in the neck. It's like, hey, you want the marriage bag? Here, here, get a look. It's just a peek, but you're not getting it. It's <laughs> what it feels like sometimes when you do shit like this, Marvel. And as, a re and as a reader, as a paying customer, I don't really appreciate that fully. But when you do go back to it, it shouldn't really surprise you that sometimes the storytelling is damn good. And this is no exception. This is a fitting conclusion to the storyline. But was it perfect? Absolutely not. First thing I need to say is that, okay, the storyline is over. I can say it. Regent sucked as a villain. He was a horrible villain. Very bland, very one-dimensional. Had he, there was nothing about him at all that gripped me. Not even in, in this issue where we finally get to see what he can really do. We saw what he can do in issue four as well, but in issues four and five, we finally get to see him work his stuff, and it was about as compelling as a wet fart. I just, Regent was a bad villain. And he will go down as a very forgettable villain. When you think, years from now, you think back on this, it's like, oh, it's the marriage brought back. Okay, who was the villain? Uh, I don't know. Let me look, let me look back and see who it was. You know, it's going to be like that, folks. I guarantee it. Um, and I'm going to say it here. I, said, I believe I said it in my, my Mary Jane Goes to Iron Man video on my Blue Goblin X channel. So go check that out, by the way. Cheap plug that I wouldn't mind seeing a Spider-Man family series with this Spider-Man family. You know, Pete, MJ, and Amp. Annie Mae Parker. She calls herself Amp. And I still feel that way. Regardless of what anybody at Marvel thinks, that Peter Parker only works as a single character, that's a load of, that's that's bullshit. Peter Parker can work as a married man. And it only ages the character, Joe, depending on how you write the stories. Huh. But anyway, this was what it was. I wasn't a fan of, you know, Spider-Man seemingly being able to break out of Regent's prison when no other superhero could do that. It's like none of the other heroes, and I'm sure there are plenty of them that are way stronger than Spider-Man is, yet Spider-Man can break out. Nobody else could. It's like, well, then again, there's the whole, well, they're in the stasis chambers. They're, they're pretty much dead. But, um, yeah, I guess, I guess putting Peter alive in a capsule was what ultimately screwed Regent over.
So, okay, there is that. But overall, this was a decent issue, and the story the, the miniseries overall was enjoyable. I did like it. I give this issue a 3.5. All right, moving on to Darth Vader number nine, Gillen and LaRocca. Man, this is this is still really gripping. You know, I'm you know I'm reading the series, and you know it's like we gotta remind. And I feel like I need to remind myself. Hey, remember, Darth Vader's supposed to be a villain. And the way they're building this guy, the way they're building Vader up in this series. It makes you want to root for him. But remember, he's a bad guy. We're not supposed to root for the bad guy, but the way they're writing this, kind of feel like... It, it's. It, I don't feel like it's intentional. I feel like they're unintentionally making Vader a, a character that you root for. You know, because sometimes even villains... Because even villains have fans. You know, and I'm a fan of Vader... But the stuff that Vader does in here, it's very true to the character. Very true to him. Um, you know, you don't just you don't just slap Darth Vader on a book and just have him do a bunch of evil shit and then then you there you there then say print it. You know, it's like you need to have purposing. You need to have plot direction. You need to have good character development. You need to have gripping storytelling that adds to the character development. And Marvel knows this, with, especially with a well-established character like Darth Vader. And the stuff that we get in here, I feel like is very true. Now, I'm not going to go into detail of what's in the book because this is still such a good series. I don't want to ruin it. But all I, all I will say is reading this, seeing Darth Vader in this book, I'm like, that's, that's really Vader. That's so Vader of him to do some of the shit that he does in here. All in all, it's still a really enjoyable series. Really, really digging it. And even though we know what's going to happen later on down the line, it is refreshing to see to see new storytelling on what might have possibly happened between each of the movies. So there you go. I give this, I give this a four, actually. Pick of the week time, folks. Pick of the week goes to Giant Size Little Marvel AVX number four. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh man this what can you say Scotty Young man this has easily been one of the best things about Secret Wars easily one of the best tie-ins easily one of the best books in general on the shelf outside of Daredevil or outside of Spider-Man I mean this this was so refreshing, this was fun, this was a treat, I love it, it's gripping, it's great. God damn. What more can you say about this? I mean, you had, it's not just Avengers versus X-Men. Now you're bringing the Guardians of the Galaxy into this. And then when we see later on down the line, especially at the ending of the book, that's probably my one and only problem with this series is the way it ended. So don't get me wrong. I liked the ending. But the ending showed us some characters that we're only going to see in this ending. I was like, "Man, that's the one thing I it's the one thing I wish we could have gotten more of." Cuz when we see who we see at the end of the book, I'm like, "Damn it. Should have used them more." Should have used those characters more. Absolutely, yes. But other than that, this has been one of the most fun reads I've read from Marvel's this year. I swear to God, I honestly feel that way. This has just been magnificent. This was awesome. I give it a 4.5. Secret Wars 2099, number 5. Uh... <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, this was all right. This was this was pretty good. It's Peter David. Uh, 
you know, in, in the end, the Avengers and the Defenders, you know, trying to figure out what really makes a hero. Is a hero one that's willing to help their fellow man regardless of what side of the law they work for? You know, because is a hero really defined by who you work for or who or what you believe in? You know, stuff like that. I thought this was a good way to think about that. Um, Miguel O'Hara, um, one thing I will say, in the next, in the upcoming reboot of Spider-Man 2099, I don't want this Miguel O'Hara to be that Spider-Man. I do not want this Miguel O'Hara. Because there are times this character is too dark and too much of an asshole. I don't want this Miguel O'Hara. I want the Miguel we, we, we've had before. I don't want this Miguel. If we have this Miguel in the upcoming new Spider-Man 2099, I can't guarantee I'll stick with it. Because it's it was interesting to have him in there in a different perspective, but do I want a Miguel O'Hara like that on a permanent basis? Absolutely not. So... You know, it is what it is. And the way the issue ends, it ends very Peter David-ish. Yeah, I don't know how else to put it. Um, a good read, but I've seen better stuff from Peter David in all, in all fair honesty. I give this a 3.5. We're ending this review with Star Wars Shattered Empire number one. Greg Rucka. Um, yeah, really good stuff in here. I love the interior artwork from Chichetto. Uh, hope I didn't butcher that name. But I like the fact that this issue doesn't doesn't start at the uh, after Return of the Jedi is over with. This is this little thing is starting at the climactic uh, at the climactic at the around the the third act of Return of the Jedi. We see Luke and Vader dueling on the deaths, dueling in front of the Emperor in the beginning of the book. So we know that Return of the Jedi is basically still going on when this book starts. And then in the middle of the book we get to the afterwards. What's going on after the Empire is defeated and the Rebels have won, but have the Rebels truly won? And we get some new characters in here, and I like them. They're really good. Uh, their storytelling, their character development so far, for the most part, has been really compelling. And I like where they're going with this. You know, even after, even after the fact that they have crushed the Empire very hard, there's still moments where you're like, uh-oh, now what? And I like that they do that with this. Like, I'm, I'm not going to go into detail because I don't want to ruin it for, for a lot of you out there. But what I will say is, this wasn't what I expected. I was expecting something totally different than what I got. Now, what I was expecting was uh, focusing on main, solely the main characters after Return of the Jedi. But no, we got some, some fresh characters. We got... Um, the story going in a slightly different direction, and I, I dig that. I think it's a plus. I thought this was a good read, and if you're a Star Wars fan, I'd say pick it up. I give it a 3.5. Well, that's all for this review, everybody. Please subscribe to this channel, Blue Goblin 01. Don't forget Blue Goblin X. Please go up there and check out my, uh, my video where I discuss my thoughts on Mary Jane Watson going to Iron Man. Don't forget Arkham Asylum Studio. Jennifer and I just finished another taste test review. And I'm hoping to get that uploaded as soon as possible. Uh, give me a thumbs up. Comments. You know, subscribe. You know, share my videos. You know, enjoy me wherever you want to. You're here on YouTube. You can find me on Facebook. Twitter, at BlueGoblin01. You can find me on Tumblr, just BlueGoblin. You can find me on Pinterest. You know, do whatever you want. Also, much love and respect to my bros, the Mount Vernon Kid, Deadpoolzilla, Brandon Hex. Uh, thanks again for watching, everybody. I am Groot. I'll see y'all later.